This is Tripwire Week in Review for week ending December 17th. I'm Martha Kocher with Trep, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS Commercial Real Estate and CLO Markets. I'm with Manis Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Joe McBride, Head of Siri Finance. This week, the CDC predicts a 55% increase in COVID cases by Christmas, triggering a wave of canceled events and new restrictions. The Fed said that it will double the pace of tapering and announced three rate hikes in 2022. A slew of economic data was released for investors to react to. Retail sales slowed last month. Both consumer and wholesale inflation increased at some of the fastest pace on record. Jobless claims edged above 200,000, but were still at historic lows, and manufacturing activity slowed in early December. Manus, markets initially moved up despite the hawkish move from the Fed. So it seemed investors were taking the Fed's pivot in stride, but somehow that changed today. It was really hard to get one's arms around the market moves with regard to the data that was coming out. It almost seemed like everything that was happening was counterintuitive. You know, starting last Friday, we saw a CPI that was slightly higher than anticipated, a 6.8% year over year headline number, 4.9% core. Even though that was higher than anticipated, the markets rallied that day and treasuries didn't budge. So you know, maybe on Friday, you could chalk that up to people saying, well, it was only modestly worse than we thought it was, you know, therefore that's kind of a win. Let's put risk on. Uh, on Tuesday, PPI blows past estimates, you know, unlike CPI, it wasn't a narrow beat. It was a huge blow past that 9.6% year over year headline was just extraordinary. 6.9% core, but on that day, treasuries seem, again, only modest moves and the equity markets only slightly lower. Wednesday, the Fed announces, you know, a quicker taper, uh, which is always very hard for me to explain. It's like, I'm going to let the bathroom fill up less quickly by pouring in less water and letting it empty out faster. It's a hard thought to get my arms around, but well, it's, it's, it's actually, you're emptying out the bathtub at the same rate. You're just pouring in more slowly. Whatever it is, you it's, stop a clumsy, pouring in, uh, right? it's a clumsy thing to try to explain, but, um, you know, it's kind of at my age, I'm shrinking, but not as fast as I was shrinking or shrinking faster than I was last month. I don't know, but, <laughs> um, anyways, you know, so the fed announces, we're going to accelerate the taper. And they give more guidance on what their rate hike plans will be, which was three in, in 2022, two in 23, and two in 24. And the markets completely melt up, right? Between the few minutes before the Fed announcement came out and the end of the day, the NASDAQ is up almost 3%. So my narrative going into today's podcast, after seeing how the markets were reacting, was that there's a lot of complacency there. The markets go up or hold steady, regardless of how high inflation is, regardless of more hawkish Fed. Um, and, and investors seem to be just really discounting any potential impact from higher than expected inflation, from Omicron shutdowns, from geopolitical events or anything else. And while that narrative was bubbling in my mind, Thursday we sell off. Tech stocks are down 2.5% on very little economic news. So uh, it, it's really hard to get your arms around what the average investor is thinking right now when you see the markets behave the way they do. Nothing makes sense anymore, Manus. Uh, I think we were saying this before, right? It's very hard to to tell why the market moves in any one direction, any particular day. But I do have this feeling, and maybe the feeling is coming from the fact that I've been in Manhattan the last couple of days and kind of seeing people are a little bit stricter on the masks. They're checking your IDs a little bit more. Like this is the first time I've had to show Vax cards and stuff to get in places. And whereas I think when we first came back, things had kind of settled down and, you know, it was kind of hit or miss on the compliance and all that type of stuff. I almost feel like the market's a little bit on pins and needles in terms of like, we're a, we're a scotch away from big lockdowns, it feels like. I mean, I, I, I hope that's not the case, but seeing kind of what we're seeing, 
that there might be some fear there that we kind of lock down again. That wouldn't explain the tech sell-off. You would think tech would do well with the lockdowns like they did before, but added lockdowns, huge PPI number, which you would think leads to CPI number staying high for the next few, several months, supply chain stuff still going on. It's kind of a little bit, little bit of a funny feeling right now in the market, I'd say. Well, on the COVID-19 front, I, I tend to agree with what you're saying. When you see that seven NFL teams are in advanced protocol, meaning they can't practice in place and, and they have to do things by Zoom call and so forth, you know, that's almost 25% of the league. Last night, Broadway shut down several plays because I guess it was the actors who were exposed and, and they couldn't put on a full uh, cast. So they had to shut down, I guess, temporarily. We've seen some NHL games canceled. So when you put that all together, at least from my observation deck on the couch with my feet up and the remote in my hand, jumping back and forth between the Ranger game and, you know, Thursday night football or whatever I'm watching on any given day, it seemed very tenuous to me. And early in the week, I couldn't reconcile the rally we saw and the bullishness and the stiff upper lip when it came to, you know, the, the hotter than expected inflation data. It just didn't make sense to me. Today seemed to make more sense to me when we saw that big tech sell-off, when you consider all the things that could go wrong in the next six months. You know, it, it seems like it should be a little bit more risk-off than it was earlier in the week. And we saw, among others, the big one, we saw Apple say they're moving back the return to office indefinitely and giving everybody a 1000 bucks for... Uh, office equipment. I don't think they'd be giving them everybody a thousand bucks for office equipment if they were planning to come back in a month. Well, right? there was a lot of that this this last couple of weeks. We saw several yeah. large firms announce that they were going back to that work from home uh, scenario. I guess it, at least it's a good time. I think people probably shut down to some degree over the holidays too. Maybe that's enough to to kind of corral this thing. Time will tell. But uh, it does feel very tenuous. And, you know, to your point on Apple, not the work from home part, we talked about today's sell-off. Apple was one of the big losers today, down 4%. So the market had a decidedly risk-off tone today compared to earlier in the week. Turning first to retail, we announced, at least comment on the retail numbers for last month. Open-air shopping centers have benefited from some of that. They've had increased foot traffic more people moving to the suburbs. So they've had a net absorption that reached the highest point in 10 years, according to CBRE Group. It was an interesting article too that dove into that story. The Wall Street Journal had that this week. There's a lot going on in retail. I'm not sure I have enough in there to call it a narrative. We try to bucket things on this podcast with themes and, and try to come up with things. And sometimes it's easy and, and sometimes it's not. On the retail side, uh, shortly, we'll talk a little bit about New York retail, which we saw a couple of things happen there. But um, I would probably look at retail this way if I had to put together a theme. One is that it seems like sales are re-accelerating on those parts of the market that did well during COVID. Saw a lot of grocery anchored sales over the last week in the Southeast, in the Southwest, in the Far West. Uh, a lot of transactions taking place with seemingly low cap rates. Uh, so that market, you know, economic activity is taking place at a pretty high velocity. I would say it was similar, although probably not as accelerated in the, the shopping center that is not essential. So those that are filled with a TJ Maxx, Marshalls, Hobby Lobby, Joann's, Michaels, Burlington, et cetera, Pretty good activity there. And again, not microscopic cap rates, but, but very aggressive cap rates. And on the mall side, it was a little bit of a mixed bag. We saw some auction results come out for some legacy stuff, which was mixed. Some were better, some were worse than what people were expecting. We saw a huge CMBX six retail loan resolved with uh, about a 90% loss. And we did see one modification of... Uh, a legacy mall loan in Georgia. We'll talk a little bit more about those momentarily. I mean, I think just kind of macro view here on the inflation side that the PPI numbers and the CPI numbers both, they can't bode well 
for the long-term health of brick and mortar, can they? I mean, unless you're going with the Chipotle uh, method, which is you have one person working in the store doing doing all the cooking and just handing the bags out the back window. That doesn't really work for, uh, you know, a shop in a mall. I feel like the the cost of goods and especially the cost of labor is just going to continue to increase. We have seen a lot of profit margin expansion in a lot of the corporate earnings over the last, you know, couple months, but I'm not sure how long those can last when, you know, workers are striking or not going back, right? Demanding much higher wages. So on the, on the retail front, you know, I look at some of this, even the store we talk about all the time, the storefronts in the city, if they can't get the guy back in there for whatever they pay 10 bucks an hour, 12 bucks an hour, like, you know, what happens, right? So well, a lot of that margin expansion may be a function of the commingling of e-commerce and bricks and mortar and the e-commerce helping that margin expansion considerably, right? We've seen a lot of headlines and we've talked about some of them of retailers splitting the two apart. I think Neiman Marcus this week was the latest to discuss potentially doing that. We said Coles was looking at that as well and sex. So it's hard to get a sense of a really clean look at if margins are really expanding on the bricks and mortar, my guess is that they're not. It's the, the e-tailing, which is subsidizing the bricks and mortar, but I, I think more color will come out on that as time goes on. Um, I'm gonna let Joe talk about the New York City retail stuff in a moment, but I'll run through before then uh, a couple of headlines that we talked about in Trep Wire. One of the big ones was the $31 million shops on main loan that was part of CMBX 6. I think everybody knows the CMBX story. If you don't ping me via email and I'll be happy to, to bring you up to speed on that or listen to some of our older podcasts. This was a story that the property is in White Plains, New York, a New York City suburb. It has about 260,000 square feet. It only had two tenants originally when the loan was made. Walmart had about two thirds of the space. Burlington Coat Factory had the other one third. Both firms closed up those locations. We flagged this for our readers back in 2018. So we gave people a lot of time to trade out of this position. Why this got my attention? Well, the collateral was valued at 57 million at securitization. It was lowered to 13 million in 2020. 10 million in 2021 and the resolution proceeds were only 3.7 million. So 60% or 70% lower than the most recent valuation. And what that added up to was a $30 million loss on the loan, which was bigger than expected. That was one of the big stories that we were watching this week. Another one that caught our interest uh, if the first one is a little chilling to CMBX shorts, this next one will be uh, a little bit of a balm for them. This is about the $84 million Discover Mills loan. This is a loan in a, a property in Georgia, uh, Lawrenceville, Georgia. It was renamed Sugarloaf Mills a couple of years ago. And why this got my attention was just yesterday, the loan was extended for a fourth time. The loan was originally supposed to mature in 2011. It was a five-year loan made in 2006. It was extended to 2013 and then 2018 and then 2021. And now this latest trip to special servicing, which I believe is the fifth, pushes the maturity date out to 2024. So. It is a story that just goes to show that sometimes extend and pretend really, really goes on and on for a long period of time. In this case, we're now looking at, it'll be almost 20 years if this thing pays off in 2024. Yeah, we did have some, I don't know if we can call them green shoots, maybe more little tiny weeds popping out of the dirt. Uh, I don't know what's, what's the right term, but we had a few. Peach uh, fuzz? Beach funds, yeah, exactly. Uh, we uh, we saw a couple stories in uh, New York retail, right? One was from the Wall Street Journal uh, talking about 1600 Broadway in Times Square 
It's a 25,000 square foot retail parcel rented out to the M&M store, which is like, you know, the, the M&M experience type store. I would call it like the FAO Schwartz of candy. For those of you who remember my uh, playing the piano and Tom Hanks playing the piano in big, anyway, going all over the place there with some movie references. Paramount Group bought the space for $190 million. That's about $7,600 per square foot. Eminem's lease goes out another 15 years. Uh, this is the Wall Street Journal story. So not necessarily a great number if this was pre-COVID times, but signs of life and a positive that we're seeing some activity in that area. This was after we had talked last week about Signature Bank, the 535th Avenue acquisition, which is a couple blocks over on 5th Ave of a big uh, retail parcel on the first two floors of an office building on 5th Ave. But Again, these are large retail spaces with relatively long-term leases occupied by national tenants, right? So M&M's is one. The 535th have had a Dwayne Reed, a Five Below, an Uggs. I think they also have a JP Morgan in there, although I'm not sure. Uh, that, that one also sold for, sold for $190 million. So a couple of signs of life. And I know there was, a, there was another lease deal, Manus, that you had done as well, right? Yeah, the... A couple of things that I'll bring up on, on the ones that you were talking about, then I'll jump over to the, the lease one. The 535th that you were just talking about, that $190 million price was down by about a third from where the property sold, uh, I think, five years ago. In 2014, yeah. Yeah, so uh, for those looking for comps, you know, that's probably where that market is, right down 35% from where it was in 2019. The Wall Street Journal article said that Times Square on Black Friday, I thought this was another green shoot, foot traffic on that day was only 20% lower than it was in 2019. You know, I think that only being down 20% on an area that relies so heavily on tourists, and it doesn't seem like New York tourists are back, I thought that was a good sign that it's only down 20% from 2019. And I do believe, and I do agree with you, Joe, that uh, in some ways, any sale is a good sale in Times Square right now. It shows that people are betting on that market, and there's a leap of faith that people will come back. And, and I love stories like that. The other story I was going to talk about was, uh, and this I think came from The Real Deal, they were saying that a 1,000-foot souvenir shop at 566 7th Avenue went for $660 a square foot. The article states that that's a little bit less than half of what the asking rents were pre-COVID. Asking rents had been uh, almost 1500 bucks pre-COVID. So the fact that so many wants the space is good because there is a lot of boarded up shops all throughout Midtown Manhattan. So that's a good sign. The article also notes that other souvenir shops one avenue away on 8th Avenue were getting leases of 150 and 200 bucks a square foot not too long ago. So 660 is certainly much better than that. Although I'd be quick to point out that 8th Avenue is, even though it's one avenue away, is a vastly different market in terms of foot traffic than 7th Avenue. So take it for what it is. I see it as a modest green shoot uh, and the market coming back to life, even though it's still less than 50% of where we were pre-COVID. Turning to office, we had a couple stories that take us back to Chicago. Yeah, the Chicago ones, I would guess, are crabgrassy. And then we got some positive stories after that. Uh, one of the stories we talked about last week was 100, 135 South of LaSalle. It's a little bit of a, a complex story. We mentioned that B of A would be leaving their 800,000 square feet there. Debt service coverage ratio would fall below 1.0x. Occupancy would plunge to, I think, about 25%, something like that. Originally, it was reported that the owner was planning to invest heavily to refresh that part of the market. That was later walked back, and it was said that the owner was not, the owner's AM trust was not going to refresh that particular building and was engaging in conversations to restructure the loan. This week, we got remittance data on that particular asset, and uh, in fact, it could be a candidate for deed in lieu. The loan has been sent to special servicing. In December, it went 30 days delinquent. And the comments that came with the remittance report indicated that the borrower feels there's there will be insufficient cash flow 
to pay debt service operating expenses and capital costs. And they do not see, and I'm quoting there here, a sufficient increase in the foreseeable future. So, and here at occupancy, I said it was 20%. As of Q3 2021, 23% for that building. So certainly some crabgrass there. The other Chicago story, this is 175 West Jackson. It also became 30 days delinquent this month. Um, the borrower is experiencing substantial difficulty remaining current on the loan. The asset contains 1.4 million square feet, latest occupancy 63%. DSER has been under 10X since 2017. It makes up uh, a sizable chunk of a CMBX 7 deal. The entire loan is almost 260 million. So a couple of bad headlines in the Chicago market. We've pointed out in the past that Chicago has, just like New York with Hudson, Hudson Yards, has seen a lot of building near the river, which has attracted a lot of new tenants, you know, people moving from one area to another. Kirkland and Ellis was one of the big moves earlier this year. And what that does is it leaves buildings, you know, that uh, are older, clamoring and, and searching for tenants. And, and these two offices are in that category. So we saw some other Nice headlines uh, over the last couple of days that were green shoots. We started with the Chicago crabgrass. Here are a couple. In Atlanta, there's a 200,000 square foot lease for the Center for Global Health Innovation. They will be taking over the former AT&T building. It's near the Fox Theater in uh, Atlanta, which is just a great venue that has seen everybody from Mott the Hoople back in the early 70s to Bruce Springsteen to the Grateful Dead and the Rolling Stones all the way through uh, Haley's Generation and Chance the Rapper and, and other people that are much more modern. Elsewhere, we saw Riot Games bought a Seattle office for $114 million. They will be employing 400 people there. That's according to GeekWire. Just a couple of weeks ago, Riot Games signed on for a big lease near Los Angeles, so they're expanding very quickly. Uh, just today, Thursday, December 16th, it was announced that Google bought a, a big Mountain View, California office. It's near their Googleplex headquarters. Uh, they're paying $1,225 per square foot, so it's $1,225 for a two-story, 60,000 square foot office. Uh, they're paying over $70 million for that. Uh, lastly, we saw a record in downtown Phoenix, uh, City Office REIT paid $150 million for Block 23. It's a multi-tenant office building. It sets a new record for uh, that particular area and segment. It's a 300,000-square-foot Class A office that went for $150 million, as I said. So, again, more macro. I just literally, uh, at this moment, got an inbound from our friend Donut Shorts, and there was there's a... Uh... A nice Bloomberg article that kind of is summing up all of the confusion that's going on with the return to office right now. And just a few things out of it. Citigroup has told staffers in their New York City metropolitan area to work from home through the holidays. Citadel did the same thing. JP Morgan has moved a big healthcare, San Francisco healthcare conference online. Uh, Apple and Google indefinitely postponing their return to office dates. Right. There's, and then there's just a bunch of kind of anecdotal stuff about canceled Christmas parties and other things. Jeffries told bankers to go back to remote after Thanksgiving. Morgan Stanley uh, has had some recent outbreaks in there. I don't think they've made a move here yet that I can see, but I just think that again, we're on pins and needles here for in terms of another shutdown. Right. And I guess, uh, <laughs> We can all argue about the merits of the shutdowns one way or the other, but I think we can say that generally probably not good for the long-term health of the office sector and the all of the other property types that are supported by the office worker, right? The, the uh, street retail, the travel hotel, that type of thing. So I don't think anybody's happy to see to see this right now. It's interesting because I started talking earlier this week with some of my buddies from around the country that I share texts with, we're all sports fans. 
talking about how tenuous it feels. And I also brought it up with, you know, family members locally and, and so forth. And, and I kept using that word tenuous, <laughs> joking that I'm just not ready to go back and watch more repeats of cornhole and axe throwing on, on television like we did early in the uh, pandemic. You know, I'll really miss football if, if they take it away again. But I was met with a little bit of surprise. People didn't feel the same way. And it'll be interesting to see if, when I go back to these friends, you know, over the next week, if their, their tenor changes. I think most people had been just not re maybe not focused or maybe where they were located. You know, they weren't hearing of, of cases or of, of closings or anything else. But, you know, when I was just watching the scroll bar on the bottom of ESPN with all the people in the protocols in the NBA and, and so forth, I mean, that was a kind of an early tell for me that, that, that we might be on uh, our way to something that looks a little bit like it was during the summer of 2021. And I'm with you, Joe. I, I really hope not. So I'm giving my class their final exam on Monday, Monday night, in person. Thank you very much. Real, actual paper and pen and pencil and calculators, like, you got to actually do it. And I've already gotten several emails from people asking to take it online, my family, my friends, my roommates tested positive, so on. And so I don't know, it's, it's definitely starting to hit home more and more. And now most of the people that I've interacted with, if they were positive, it was asymptomatic or not that bad, but it just takes one large institution or one large government entity or one, you know, to kind of set that first domino in motion to just say, all right, you know what, we're all done for the next month. And then the next month, God knows what that really means, right? Didn't you tell me, Joe, that you you parcel out grades through some random number generator? You don't even grade these things? Well, actually, for any student, I don't think any of my students listen to this podcast. But oh, if is they that did, possible? I've told them several times, but I'm not sure if they're listening uh, while I'm in class. I'm definitely not sure if they're listening the, to the podcast. So let's let's do this, okay? Chocolate chip cookie. That's the code word. I will put a question on the final on Monday night that says, what's the code word? And if you say chocolate chip cookie, there's going to be some extra credit in it for you. Look at that. There you go, Joe. Well, you saw the news that Cornell had a, uh, had a wave of cases and they've apparently had about 900 new cases in just the last week, I think. Wow. No, I hadn't seen that. That's uh, extraordinary. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, probably one of the worst cases we've seen at the schools, but probably not the kind last. Kind of hard to believe is Cornell is one of those places where they start getting snow around Labor Day and people are in hibernation by, you know, Columbus Day. You would think that it would be hard for that stuff to spread up there, right? Nobody ventures out because you have a foot of snow uh, before Halloween. Turning to hotels, hotel booking cancellations increased 35% since November, according to one travel search firm. And holiday travel planning is down 10%. And not surprising, people are looking domestically rather than international. So it does show how sensitive the lodging market is to some of this news that we've seen in the last couple of weeks. Well, there's always going to be a delayed reaction between the bookings and the economic activity that defines sales, right? As we, as we all know, a sale isn't done in a day. It takes... Uh, weeks, if not a couple months to market your property and get it out there and get bids and have due diligence and everything. So whatever downturn we're seeing now probably won't start showing up in higher cap rates or slower economic activity until early next year. So what we've seen this week is more of the same. For several weeks now, we've talked about how buoyant the hotel market has been. In some ways, it seemed like it was getting a little ahead of itself with really puny cap rates and people buying things off 2019 uh, NOI and so forth. It was more of the same. And I'll run through some of the stories we were following this week. On the CMBS side, we saw several more sizable loans that had been distressed for a long period of time cure. Uh, that included the Magnolia Hotel loan in Houston, a double tree near the Miami airport, uh, Hilton in Pittsburgh, an Oklahoma hotel portfolio, and a portfolio in Wrigleyville in Chicago. So that's a pretty wide distribution geographically. Also the Breakwater Hotel in Miami Beach. 
that's a pretty wide dispersion of geography and property type. All of those were loans that were 60, 90 or more delinquent, all of which came current in the December reporting cycle. And we're only about 40% of the way through the December reporting cycle at this point. So a lot of green shoots there. Uh, other places that we saw transactions take place, Noble Investment Group bought three newly constructed hotels, one in Charlottesville, VA, one in Tallahassee, and another in Tallahassee. So obviously a college town play there. We saw the Doubletree uh, Suites in Minneapolis go for 168K per key. The buyer was MCR Hotels, the seller was HRI Properties. That price was down about 25% from where the property traded in 2016. So Minneapolis, kind of a 50-50 market, right? We had the protests over the summer, which got a lot of headlines. We've seen some businesses leave, not a big tourist destination normally. Um, so maybe that's where that market is, 25% down uh, over the last five years. Dauntless Capital, this comes from Commercial Observer, bought two Washington, D.C. hotels. One was the Moxie, uh, a 200-key hotel, which they paid 430 k for. Also, the Courtyard by Marriott, 143-key hotel, kind of a similar price, 462 per key. And lastly, the MGM Resorts, big one for this, for this week. They sold the Mirage Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas to Hard Rock International, a 10-digit uh, price tag there, $1.08 billion. And they're going to build a guitar-shaped hotel. I think the Hard Rock had a hotel there already. I guess maybe this is number two for them, or maybe they sold the old one. The guitar-shaped one? Uh, I'm not sure. They do have a guitar-shaped one, I think, in Florida. Yeah. I'd want to stay next to the Whammy Bar. You know, the thing that goes wah, 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 wah. <laughs> the wah-wah pedal? The wah, 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 wah. Yes, the, the wah-wah you know, you know, wah, 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 wah. I will say... We need to come up with the Clancy, the Manus Clancy Schiller same store or same hotel sale index because each one of these stories has is a sub story within itself about that particular market, right? So you said uh, in one of these, it was 25% below where it had traded uh, a few years back, right? And, but then we see some other stories where it's kind of in line with 2019. They're kind of in line with 2019 values. So uh, obviously every property is its own property, but, uh, being able to well, see every, these kind every of comp market, Every market unit. is local. And I think where you're seeing these great comps from 2016 or 2019 are those beach destinations, vacation destinations, drive to getaways, skiing, anything like this, you know, something in downtown Minneapolis, you have to believe that a big part of their revenue base is that business traveler. Right. And not only is the business traveler hard to find in 2020 and 2021, but you've also seen a, uh, a pullout in Minneapolis of Target and others. Um, so less firms in there to begin with and, and, and smaller space requirements. So, you know, it's hard to make a, a comparison market to market. But I do think if we're talking in generalities, right, markets like Minneapolis, Detroit, Indianapolis, things like that will probably behave similarly, which is you're selling for a discount compared to where you were uh, three or four years ago. All right. Turning to shout outs, we have Julie G, who is actually uh, someone who sent a note to Susie S, who then forwarded on that shout out. So thank you. She enjoys Julie the podcast. Julie G, one of, one of the biggest of cheeses, a big cheese that listens to the podcast. Yeah. That's very, I love seeing that. And loves a podcast, listens every week. So thank you, Susie, for forwarding on her comments. And you can relay that to her. Aaron B. Loved the updates and is a longtime listener. Mike M. Enjoys the podcast and sent over some Chicago hotel information to us. Thank you for that. And via Twitter, BB Dogged Tenacity, a frequent uh, FinTwit friend of ours, tweeted at us about a Tripwire story. And at Commercial Recap said that the Trepwire podcast should be noted on the top of the CRE influencers. So you know what? We are going to agree with that and uh, and see if we can't get that officially recognized. Dan McNamara, a friend uh, who's been on the pod, shared our CMBX6 retail loan hit with 95% loss severity. 
So thank you for doing that. And guys, I know Christmas is a week away or so, and you're probably feverishly planning what you're going to be shopping for at the last minute, but we're going to be doing our week in review next week as we normally do. We're also going to be doing a resolutions and predictions podcast for the last week of the year. So if listeners have any resolutions, predictions, or other interesting things of note about the market or the CRE sector, send it to us and we'll be happy to share it with our listeners. The weirder, the better, please. Definitely for Joe. With that, we'll close. Thank you to our producer, Haley Keen. Join us next week as we review what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question or comment, send an email to podcast at trep.com. And if you have information you're looking for about TREP, check it out, trep.com, subscribe to the podcast. Thank you for listening and stay well. All right. 